Impact. Nice shot, Jake. Thanks. What do you think about that? You like that Bushnell scope too? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty nice, isn't it? Nice and yeah. clear. And shooting that 260 off of a tripod like that's pretty sweet. Yeah. Hey guys, Sam Millard here. Uh, welcome back to the Precision Rifle Load Development Series. This will be part eight. All right, this will be the last video in the load development series. Uh, every other video after this is just going to have a different name, and we'll come up with some different things to talk about. But part eight will be kind of the update on what happened with my barrel at the end, uh, what my final load was, and then I'm going to tell you some of the things that I changed, some of my techniques and process, as well as a couple of tools that I added. And then we're also going to talk about brass and ammo management, because I've been getting a lot of questions about that. Now this is the barrel. This is the 260 Remington barrel that I started this video series with. I pulled it at 2,119 rounds. The last group I shot with it was a .3 something five shot group at 100 yards. So it, was still, it still had plenty of accuracy left in it. But it's been my experience that somewhere between 2,000 and 2,800 rounds, you're probably going to kill the barrel. And you're going to either have to set it back or you're going to have to put a new barrel on it. So looking at my schedule, uh, we have uh, we have a couple of matches. We have one more match coming up this year. That'll be next week. That's a two-day match. It's got a 240 round a round count on the match. We just shot a one-day series finale, and then we shot uh, the week before another national level match. So uh, you know when you get signed up for all these matches, you have to think about how many rounds you're going to fire, not only in the match but as well as in practice. So I knew that if I left this barrel on. Right about now, I'd be looking at 26 to 2700 rounds down the tube, and uh, it just didn't make any sense not to have another barrel ready to go. So what I did was at 1,426 rounds, I took this barrel off, this 260 Remington barrel, and I chambered a barrel in 6547. Now, all I wanted to do is just try that cartridge, and I found a reamer off the shelf that looked like it might work. So. I got lucky, the seating depth on the, the reamer was perfect for 140 grain bullets and I fired 30 or 40 rounds through the barrel just to break it in and to get an idea of how it would shoot with the components I had on hand. And then I put it back in the rack and I put my 260 Remington barrel back on. Now at four or 500 rounds where I let off on this video series at part 7, uh, I was running 40.8 grains H4350 with 140 grain ELD at 2.040 on my comparator. That put me at 10 thousandths off the of lance. At 1,426 rounds, I measured the throat on this and found that I'd burned forward 60 thousandths. So, uh, you know, I don't shoot groups all the time. Most of my shooting has been in practice, off barricades, long range, things like that. But I do shoot 100 yard groups every now and then just to make sure my zero is perfect and to make sure the barrel's still shooting well. What I noticed was that the accuracy hadn't dropped off at all, but when I did a random velocity test, my velocity had dropped off a little bit. So uh, that was my, my thinking on my throat measurement. So what I did at that point was I just adjusted my load, I pushed it out 60 thousandths, made the, the round longer by 60 thousandths, so I can get back to 10 off the lands, and then I added powder to get my velocity back up. So from 40.8 at 2.040, I adjusted to 42.5 at 2.100 and it brought me right back up to the velocity that I'd been running before. And when I pulled the barrel off and fired those last couple of groups just to see what it was shooting like, the velocity had stayed the same. So uh, that's probably no big deal. It's only six or seven hundred rounds from the adjustment, but I think the barrel probably still has a little bit of life in it. And over winter, what I'll probably do is chop the ends rechamber it and play with some throat uh, depths, you know, do a little experimenting with it basically because this barrel shot so well. But uh, for right now, now I'm going to run a 6547 until that barrel takes a dump. So a lot of guys ask me, does that mean that I've abandoned the 260 Remington? Not at all. I still have three of them. So uh, in fact, my son Jake has started shooting PRS competitions. He was going to wait till next year, but I took him to one with me this spring and he thought it was so cool, he said, just sign me up for the next one. So I had another barrel chambered in 260 Remington that uh, was threaded to go onto the receiver that we used for the 260 Terminator. So I just pulled the Terminator barrel off, put that 260 Remington tube on it, and loaded up some ammo and let him start shooting. 
So no, I'm not going to abandon the 260 Remington. Jake's going to get his own rifle over winter. We're going to have a video series that covers that build, and it's going to be chambered in 260 Remington. So, but for now, I'm just going to run the 6547 and gain a little bit of experience with the cartridge. Uh, so far, it, it seems to be pretty easy to load for. It's not quite as fast as the 260 Remington simply because of the case capacity. But I can run it at, uh, right now my load, I'm running at 2,780 feet per second. Uh, all the 140 grain bullets that I'm shooting through it, so the, the Burger VLD, the Horner D ELD, and the Sierra Match King, the 142 grain Match King, are all running about the same speed, 2,780 feet per second, with 36.7 grains of Varget. So with 36.7 grains of Varget, I can run within 20 feet per second of my 260 barrel for about 5 or 6 grain less of powder. That's pretty cool. Uh, other than that, you know, it's, it's been the same. It's the, the seating depth. I'm still running 10 thousandths off. That's where I started, and that's where it shot all those bullets about the same. Uh, so everything I did in 1 through 7, I applied to this new barrel in 6547 that I had zero experience with, and within 30 rounds I had a working load. Everything beyond that was just tinkering and playing with things because I'm a curious kind of guy. I tried all these different bullets in it to see what they would do, and those three that I mentioned shot almost identically. You could stack them into the same group, you could shoot them, uh, you know, the BCs are a little bit different across those three bullets, but out to eight or nine hundred yards, you could use the same dope on them. Uh, you know, it's just not that, it doesn't have to be complicated. So, anyway, that's where I'm at with the 6547. All right, we're back now. I actually had to go do some shooting. But uh, anyway, before I get any further along in this video, uh, one of the things I got asked a lot about was the barrel. Uh, this barrel is a Krieger. It's a heavy, heavy varmint contour. I think they call it a number 17. Uh, you can get it finished. It comes ready to be finished at 28 inches. It is the maximum length on that blank. I finished mine at 26 inches. Uh, the muzzle brake is a defensive edge four port. This starts out as a one inch brake that has to be fitted by a gunsmith or somebody with a lathe. And then I just contour it down to the end of the barrel there. But they, uh, these little four port brakes work great on these 6.5 cartridges. Uh, hardly any recoil if you've seen any of the video footage. But uh, if you're interested in one, just go to defensiveedge.net and look at them and then give them a call and order it. Okay, so as far as new tools or techniques or any uh, differences in my process, there aren't very many. Uh, the biggest single thing that I've changed is the way I use my full-length bushing die. So if you remember in, in part 7, I sized a bunch of 260 brass both on a standard RCBS die, meaning not a bushing die but just a standard full-length bushing die with an expander, and then I sized some brass with a bushing die with no expander in it. Well. Uh, you know, both of them work just fine. The only difference being is the full length die works the neck a lot more because it has to squeeze down all the different uh, thicknesses of brass. You can't tailor how much that initial squeeze is. Uh, but, as I already knew and as I think I showed in the video, you, all, you get the same product when it comes out of the die. It's just a matter of, of how much do you want to work that neck. You know, what kind of life expectancy are you expecting out of it. Uh, the biggest reason I use an expander is to punch the necks out in new brass because they almost always come too tight. Uh, I punch it out to the diameter I want to start with. If that means having to go back through a bushing after it goes through the expander, then so be it. Uh, the only other reason I use an expander is if I get dented necks because I used to not run the expander in my full length sizing die. Well, over this past summer we spent a lot of time shooting from barricades off tops of ladders, things like that and the place we were shooting has a concrete apron. So from, you know, say two to four feet off the ground, with those cases hitting that concrete, you're gonna end up with a lot of dented necks. So what I was finding was that it was getting to be kind of a pain in the ass to have to single out all of those cases and run them through a separate expander before I sized the brass. So uh, I just thought, you know, why not? I, I pulled the, the factory expander back out of the die box and all I did was I chucked it up in a drill and I just polished it just made it as smooth and shiny as I could and then put it all together ran the same bushing I was already running and then just started sizing brass uh, before I ran it over the expander I ran a batch of 10 of them 
through the bushing and then I ran a batch of 10 of them with the expander in place and the the neck diameter I think was within five ten thousandths of each other with and without the expander so uh, but anyway I shot those two 10 shot strings side by side and I saw no difference whatsoever as far as accuracy or velocity or extreme spread in muzzle velocity so uh, right now that's what I'm running is a full length type S bushing die with the factory expander in place Okay, another really cool gadget that I started using is the uh, Sinclair Universal Decapping Die. Uh, the reason I started using it is because it comes with a small flash hole pin. So on 6.5 Lapua or 6.547 Lapua, the only game in town is Lapua Brass. And it has a small uh, rifle primer pocket and it has a small flash hole. So the RCBS Universal Decapping Die won't go through that flash hole. Uh, but anyway, I found the Sinclair one and uh, it looked pretty cool, so I ordered it and uh, it's turned out to be a really good tool. It has the big decapping pins in it for your standard brass and then it has a small decapping pins for stuff like the, the small Lapua brass. Uh, the way the pins capture inside the stem is really good. It's all positive and it seems to be pretty tough. We've processed probably 1100 rounds through it now, both 260 brass and 6547 brass all using the small uh, pin to decap and haven't had any problems with it. So if you're looking for a small one, a small pin depriming tool, the Sinclair is a pretty good one. Okay, and the only new tool that I've added has been the RCBS Brass Boss. And all it is is a, it's a motorized gadget that has several stations on top that all spin at the same time. It has uh, two stations that spin faster than the rest of them. So you can you know put whatever tool you want in there, and it's a standard. Uh, oh, I don't know what the thread is, but it's a standard cleaning brush thread. So it comes with a bunch of tools like case neck brushes and uh, primer pocket cleaners and things like that that all screw down onto these rotating stations. But the things that the thing that we're using it for right now is deburring and chamfering case neck mouths when we're done trimming brass. So it comes with a VLD uh, chamfer tool and it comes with a deburring tool. And all you have to do is we put a box of 100 or 200 pieces of brass that we just trimmed on the left side of that machine and just start picking them up and running them on those two things and dropping them on the other side of another box. Uh, it's, it's really fast. It's really easy to do it that way. No more hand twisting and no more chucking up individual tools into my lathe and then having to do you know handle the same piece of brass twice. We just do it at the same time. Bang, bang, done. Uh, you know, it's not... It's not my, my dream tool. My dream tool is one of the Gerard uh, case trimmers where you, you stick it in there and it cuts the length and does the inside and outside all in one swoop. That's probably coming later, but for right now that Brass Boss is a, a really, really good stopgap tool. And uh, I'm going to do a review on it eventually, but I don't know how many pieces of brass I've put over that now. It's got to be close to... 2,500 or 3,000. I've been using it for all of my deburring and chamfering. So, and I have no have had no problems with it. It's a pretty cool tool. Okay, other than that, everything's the same. So from part one through part seven, I'm doing exactly the same thing that I showed you in those videos on this 6547 as well as on Jake's 260. So uh, nothing has changed. All right, let's talk a little bit about brass and ammo management. I get a lot of questions about that. Uh, uh, my system is pretty simple. I, I do sort them by number of times fired. I try to fire all my new brass before I get into my uh, once fired and sized brass. But uh, once you get up, what I found at least, once you get up in the you know once and twice fired uh, brass and you're running big lots of brass and you need to, you know, you, you want to move on, you want to just keep shooting and you have that 28 pieces of once fired brass and you've got you know, 540 pieces of twice fired brass here. I'm going to throw those 28 pieces in with that twice fired and they're all going to be twice fired at that point. But, uh, you know, so I'm not, I'm not super crazy about that, but I try to keep them sorted as close as I can and keep pretty good notes on how many times they're fired uh, just for a, you know, a database to see does something happen when I get to five or six times fired? Do I have to anneal, you know, before two or three times fired? You know, start to learn those things and do some things based on your experience so that you aren't wasting time or you aren't skipping a step that you need to uh, you know that you need to perform the next time around but anyway what I do is I bring them home they go into these 
These are just cashew containers. And I just put a sticky note on there what's in it and how many times they're fired. And then it sits up on a shelf above my bench there until I have to get after it, you know, once it fills up or if I need brass. But uh, what we've been doing shooting these matches is marking our, our brass. So when I prime the, the case after it's sized and everything, I stand them up so it's primer up in the loading block. And then I just uh, swipe them with a Sharpie. You know, there's, I don't know how many different color Sharpies there are out there, but Jake runs orange on his 260. When I was shooting 260 and Jake was shooting 260, I ran black on my 260 cases. So when we got home, we, you know, we'd try to keep them separated in our own packs and then I would unpack everything and keep them separated as much as possible. But, you know, if you get them mixed up or whatever, it's no big deal. So on my 6547, I'm actually just swiping them with a green Sharpie across the primer. So when I get home and I have all my spent brass from the match, I just stand them up in here empty and just eyeball them. Make sure they're all 6547. Make sure all they, you know, they all have that green stripe across the primer. Uh, but that's how we bring them home. And then once I, I know how many shots I've fired, what I've been doing uh, lately is instead of having an own data book for shots fired, I just have it in my load book. So I just put, you know, what it is, uh, what the date was, how many rounds I fired on that date, and then what the total round count is in this column. Uh, just make, that's been the easiest way I've done it. It's just stupid simple. You just write her in there and you're done. Uh, and having that date on there, if you know you shot on the 4th of November and the last entry in there is the 15th of October, then you know you missed one. So you can come back in and say, you know what, I went to the range, I fired 50 or 60 shots that day. 50 is close enough, you write it in there. And that keeps, you know, that helps you keep track of your barrel life. I don't know if it changes anything, but it gives you uh, at least some experience to base further decisions on, like pulling your barrel off and getting a new one ready to go because you know it's going to die in the next five or 600 rounds. But anyway, that's how we do our fired brass. Uh, once it comes home, it goes into that jug. And then uh, when I get ready to process all that, it's going to go into these white containers, uh, these, I just bought these at Walmart. I think I started, uh, I think I found some at a yard sale. Somebody with a, a home-based business or something was, uh, you know, closing their shutters and they were selling all their stuff. And they had a whole bunch of these. They had these in white and black and different sizes. But uh, I started using them. I thought, you know what, those work really well because you could put all your junk in there. So what I'll typically do is have two of these and I'll dump that bin in there. And then when I start working on the brass, the side that's done will go on this one. The ones I'm working on will go on that one. And then I'll go back if I need to do two parts to the process. And I can just throw a sticky note in there uh, saying whatever's in there and what part of the process I'm in. I can take them from my gun room out to my shop. I can do anything I want and they'll just stay right in there. And you can actually stack you know, different projects on top of each other. Uh, it's it's, it's really quite comical to, to do all my brass and all of Jake's brass all in one day. Uh, you, you really need to be organized to get that done. But anyway, when you're all done, you can just rinse those out with hot water, let them dry, and put them back away for the next uh, go around. But they've worked pretty well for that. Okay, for loaded ammo, uh, these, I just saw these this year. I've always used MTM uh, cases, but never this kind. This is a this is a new one they came out with. It has a, a handle. They're stackable. The way they're ribbed here, you can stack them up like that. And they have a positive latching system. So this is actually a positive latch instead of the old compression latch. So this is the H50RM size case. And I think this will allow you to put a bullet uh, loaded up like this to an overall length of 2.9. So mine are coming in under that. I have no problem, even with the 260 rounds, just closing the case. Uh, if you have something longer than that, you can turn them around and drop them in. They have a, a like a catch thing at the bottom of the tray that's in here that holds the bullet in place so it can't bottom out in there. But uh, anyway, I really like these cases. I, in fact, I'm going to uh, replace all of my old compression uh, shut ones and just run these because they stack so nicely. Uh, they're positive latches, so if you grab the top bum, that's not going to pop loose and dump your ammo all over the place. So, uh, nice cases. Now, when we go to matches, I don't really like carrying these around just because of the shape and everything. 
so what we do is we've been running when I started buying these they were Sage Flat Shooter I believe but now they're AEM Precision and they're a little outfit over in Montana that sells these but these are sleeves and they hold 40 rounds in each sleeve so for like a match it's typically 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 going to be 100 rounds to 120 over a one day match so if you have a two day match you'll need 240 rounds uh, what we do is we have you know Jake and I each have three of these so we can have 120 rounds in our pack and then we load out uh, two 10 round magazines and bring them with us. So that gives us 140 rounds no matter what, plus the two and our extra round holder on the side. Uh, and then when we're done, you know, once you strip all these rounds out and use them, you just have an empty uh, piece of nylon that's not taking up any room, which is pretty cool. Uh, as far as the empties, I just dump them right in my pack and don't worry about it. And when I get back to the to camp or the truck that night, if it's a two day shoot, I empty everything out and reload these out of these hard boxes here. Uh, but anyway, it's worked pretty well. Oh, there's probably a lot of different ways to manage your ammo like that, but uh, this has been pretty uh, foolproof and effective. All right, guys, well, that does it for the Precision Rifle Load Development Series. This will be the last one in that series. Everything moving forward is going to be its own thing. Uh, the, in leaving, I would just tell you to match your process to your needs, uh, match your uh, expectations to what you're starting out with. Uh, I'll tell you that you cannot hand load yourself out of a bad barrel. So if you're running a factory tube and you're trying to get some of these results out of your factory tube, uh, you know, it's going to be hit or miss. There's a reason why hand lap barrels cost the, the amount of money that they do, and there's a reason why we put them on these actions. So uh, something to keep in mind there. Uh, you know, you want to match your process to your needs. This is a, a precision rifle, but I also have to be able to shoot it, you know, a couple hundred rounds a week sometimes. And now that I have Jake shooting with me, you know, <laughs> I mean, we are literally, with the exception of about three weeks in August, I was averaging 150 to 200 rounds a week reloading. Uh, it, you know, I'm not used to that. Usually I, I load up a bunch right in the spring, I shoot a bunch through the summer, and then I reload those before the fall. But this year it was nonstop. Uh, one lesson I learned, start off with a bunch of brass. If you're going to shoot in these competitions and you're going to practice for these shoots, start off with a lot more brass than you think you need. I started off with, I think, 300 pieces for my 260. It wasn't enough. Uh, Jake, I only had 250 or 260 pieces of brass available for him to use in that barrel and it's not enough. He's at 243 pieces left now, you know, from loss and competitions and stuff like that. And, you know, we're going to a match at the round count. It's 240 rounds this weekend. So if he wants to do any practice at all, we have to have enough time for me to recycle that brass. And that's what, you know, he shot 63 rounds yesterday. So I have to reload that now to get him ready for Friday. Uh, with the 6547, I started with 600 pieces for that. And I know guys that are starting with a thousand pieces for their match rifle. So uh, just keep in mind that you aren't always going to have time to turn that ammo over. So it's going to be my policy to have at least five or six hundred rounds for every rifle that I'm going to compete with. Uh, you know, match the process to your needs. Obviously, this is a high volume gun. If my Canyon rifle, I do a lot of the same things to it, but the tempo isn't the same. I can do things that might take more time you know but you know a lot of this stuff flat out doesn't matter how you do it as long as you're getting good results and like I said at the beginning of the series let the results speak for themselves if it's working for you don't change it unless it's going to benefit you uh, this is very hands-on you're going to have to experiment you have to try different things in your barrel with your bullets that you choose to use with the powder that you're wanting to try with the, the, the cartridge that you want to shoot you know, they're all a little bit different. They all have the same basic, uh, you know, requirements to get them to shoot well, but you're going to have to tweak things and experiment with things. I think moving forward, I'm probably going to have a couple of back to basics type videos. I know there's been a lot of questions about resizing brass and what happens, you know, why am I not getting a bump when I do this and what, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm probably going to do the, the next reloading video is going to have to do with resizing brass. And that's all it's going to be. But uh, I also have some new Kestrel videos coming up. Jake is starting to shoot now. Uh, I'm going to teach him how to use a Kestrel so that he is completely 
independent. Uh, going into next year, he'll be able to run the Kestrel on his own, come up with his own do you know, dope, measure the wind, all that kind of thing. So uh, that's going to be a fun project. I have a few reviews coming up. Uh, some really cool stuff's going to hit the market, uh, you know, starting around SHOT Show, so be looking forward to that. Anyway, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.